Cole Patterson lives on the outskirts of Vancouver. It gives him easy access to the woods and mountains on the edge of the city. But 12 years ago, life took a turn for the worse when he started to develop some unsettling symptoms. I started to notice I was not my stri wasn't right, and I, 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 my doctor they referred me to a, a podiatrist. I think my, something on my ankle, my foot, whatever. So the podiatrist had me in a couple, a couple weeks later, and he goes, "Oh my gosh, you don't need a podiatrist; you need a, a neurologist." So I went back to my GP and got referred to a neurologist, and he went to look at me and he said, "Okay, you have you have Parkinson's." Well, holy smokes, that was that was quite traumatic. I was uh, in tears for sure. It came as a complete shock to Paul and his family, and eventually forced him to give up his job. Parkinson's is caused by an inability of the brain to release dopamine. As well as affecting our mood, dopamine helps to regulate our movement. With medication, Paul can get the dopamine he needs to keep his symptoms under control. So I take some at CR, control release is the pink one, and the two white ones are uh, Two and a half milligrams each of bromocryptans, and uh, I'm, as you see, I'm, I'm upright, I'm mobile, my, my shoulders are back. A few years ago, Parkinson's researcher, Professor John Stosen, decided to test this effective medication against a placebo. We've always known that how people do when they have a serious condition has a lot to do with their attitude, and that's intriguing to me. Paul was recruited onto John's trial. It would require him to stop taking his medication. Without it, even walking can be difficult. About a year and a half ago, I guess, I was about 50 feet from my house. I could literally see the front door. I was sitting on the sidewalk on the curb, and I couldn't get home. That was, that was something else. <laughs> took me about a half hour to get home from uh, 100 feet. Paul headed into hospital for the trial. Without having had his medication, his Parkinson's symptoms in full flare-up. And that's when they gave me this, this capsule. And they give you a half hour, 45 minutes, you know, normal period of time for the, the meds to kick in. And uh, boom, I was thinking, oh, this is pretty good. I, my, my body becomes erect, I, my shoulders go back, and uh, I needed to go to the bathroom, so I said, well, I don't need any help, I'm, I'm fine. And, uh, I uh, all struck my way down the, the hall and uh, went to the bathroom. But Paul hadn't been given any active medication. He'd been given a placebo. Well, I was shocked. There's no way I could have done that. I, I fully understand the effects of my, my medicine, so how could a nothing create those same feelings? I was, yeah, I was really shocked. <laughs> brain scans of patients with Parkinson's that were responding to the placebo helped to explain how Paul's symptoms had faded. This uh, slide shows three scans all taken from the same person with Parkinson's disease. So now you see the activity at baseline when they come in with no medication. Their Parkinson's is not well controlled. There's a loss of dopamine in the brain. So we see lots of activity here. With so little dopamine, someone with Parkinson's would be struggling to move and function. Now we look at the middle slide, and this is after uh, the person is told that they're going to get active drug, but in fact they receive placebo. And you can see a striking reduction in activity here, which indicates that their brains have released a lot of dopamine. The intense red colors in the striatum area of the brain show how little dopamine is present at baseline. The decrease in the red coloring shows how the placebo can release dopamine, just like the real drugs. What we found is that in somebody with Parkinson's disease, a placebo can release as much dopamine as amphetamine or speed can in somebody with a healthy dopamine system. So it's a very dramatic response. There are, there are physical things that change in me, my my meds. And uh, I didn't think that a placebo would be capable of you know, there's no way. How, you know, how could a sugar pill, whatever, you know, make me uh, feel like I had taken my, my cinema and I'm thrilled to death to know that I still have that ability on a short term basis to produce dopamine and get going, right? Several studies have now shown that a placebo can ease the symptoms of Parkinson's, even if only in the short term. Once again, 
The placebo works by tapping into the brain's internal pharmacy. All these studies raise another intriguing question. For a placebo to work, why do we need to believe that it's real? For Tor Wager, it's all about our expectations. They can make a difference to what happens in our bodies. And that's true, whether you take a pill, undergo an operation, or climb a mountain. Stand up on that back foot, Tor. Climbing is a dangerous sport. One falls smooth and things could go badly wrong for Tor. Except, of course, that he's got a rope. And that changes everything. Okay, I'm going right. Watch me here. Okay. He expects to be safe. Step through. Beautiful. That's it. And yet, without his belief that everything will be okay, he'd be so nervous, he could barely climb. When I was up there on the rock, my, my heart started beating, uh, blood flow changed to my fingers, uh, my brain's releasing opioids, releasing dopamine, and all those things are helping me perform. Um, and they're also having various impacts on my body. And those impacts depend on the feeling, the knowledge that I'm safe. You, know, you take off that rope, it would be a completely different world. My, my, my heart rate would go crazy. My, I'd be sweating and, and so forth. Ultimately, it's about the link between our minds and our bodies. Whether it's fear or hope, our thoughts and expectations can trigger chemical reactions that change our bodies. So if we expect a placebo to do something, it can release chemicals in our brains and change our physiology. Scientists are now exploring just how much our expectations are capable of. As well as pain, they found that placebos can alleviate conditions from depression to insomnia, nausea to attention deficit disorder. And because it's all about your expectations, even the size and shape of a pill can make a difference to how well it works. Studies have shown that capsules are more effective than tablets. A large capsule is better than a small capsule. Expensive medications are more effective than cheap medications. Color makes a difference. Red pills are more effective for treating pain. Blue pills are more effective for treating anxiety. Unless you happen to be male and Italian, in which case blue is the color of your national football team and a symbol of immense excitement, passion, and heartache. In that case, according to research, a blue pill won't help relax you. It will do the opposite. But there are clear limits to what placebos can do. They certainly won't fix a broken leg or help to shrink a tumor. But in the areas where they seem effective, scientists are beginning to wonder how we can make the most of them. There is, however, a problem with dummy pills and sham surgeries. They rely on deception. You're not told the truth. That seems to be why they work. Because you think they're real. Obviously, doctors don't want to lie to their patients. So how do we harness the power of the placebo effect without lying? It's a question that one of the most prestigious medical schools in the world is hoping to answer. In 2010, Harvard established a program in placebo studies. It aims to work out how we can use the placebo effect to make people better. Ted Kapchuk is the director. In the last 15, 20 years, there's been an explosion of research in placebo studies. We've learned so much, but there's so much more to do. The underlying goal is how do we learn to harness it and how do we learn to use it to help people get better, healthier, and stronger lives. Recently, Ted decided to challenge one of the most basic assumptions about placebos. He decided to conduct an experiment to see whether we really need to be duped for a placebo to work. The conventional wisdom was that you have to use either deception or concealment in order for a placebo to work. We decided to test whether or not you could still get a placebo effect if you gave a pe person a placebo and told them it was placebo. Linda Bonanno has suffered from irritable bowel syndrome for 16 years. At times, the symptoms are bad enough that she doesn't want to leave home. Along with 80 other sufferers of IBS, 
she was recruited onto Ted's trial. She was given some pills and told they were a placebo with no active ingredient, but that they might work thanks to her own self-healing processes. I said, what? A placebo? Because I just finished, you know, college as a medical assistant. And I'm thinking, he wants me to take sugar pills? This isn't going to work. But I said I'd do it, so I went home. I started taking them. And after three days, I realized I wasn't in any pain anymore. I didn't have any intestinal pain. I didn't keep running to the bathroom or anything like that. Um, I didn't have any stomach cramps, no blood. I had nothing. All the symptoms that the severe symptoms I had were gone. And I thought, no, this is not happening. This can't be. A sugar pill does not get rid of the, the problems, right? Linda wasn't the only study participant who reported improved symptoms from a pill she knew to be inactive. I was taken aback when, when we finished the trial and our statistician showed us the results and it was much stronger than we expected. 62% said they got adequate relief from being on the placebo pill. People who got nothing, I think it was around 30%, said they had adequate relief. So it was a real big difference with these to detect. But the study and the supply of placebo pills only lasted a few weeks. When the pills ran out, Linda's problems returned. It was three weeks, I think it was, and everything was fine. And then all of a sudden, I'm not taking them anymore, and all the symptoms came back, and it was horrible. It was like, oh, man, I got to suffer with this again. Linda decided to try and buy some more placebo pills. I tried to go to one of the uh, health food stores to buy the placebo pills, but they didn't have them. The fellow in the store was, you know, thought it was kind of odd why I would be asking for placebo pills. They had nothing else that, like, would replace it, so I couldn't do anything. I was really disappointed. Well, several patients actually asked us for more placebo pills. Our ethics committee only gave us permission for three weeks of treating people with placebo pills, and as you can imagine, I don't believe they're, they're listed as a, a, a labeled drug in the United States, so we weren't able to prescribe after that. It's hard to know why Linda's symptoms disappeared when she took something that she knew was chemically worthless. The study only looked at whether it would work, not why. But Ted has a theory. What I think happened is that just seeing our study physician, taking pills two times a day, in some way your body feels, recognizes, moves in a way that's moving towards health. This is the body knowing something that's beyond our ability to consciously be aware of. I don't understand it. I don't know why. I probably never will, but there's something. I think, I think I'm wishing for a cure, and I'm wishing for something to make this all disappear. I think if I wish hard enough, it'll work, I guess. Exactly why the pills worked remains a mystery. And a small, short-term study like this certainly doesn't mean that we can simply replace real drugs with placebos. But it does call into question the fundamental assumption about placebos the idea that we need to be duped for them to work. At Harvard, other scientists are searching for ways that we can use the power of the placebo without deception. One of Ted's colleagues has studied something you might have thought wouldn't have anything to do with placebos, and that is hypnosis. There's a lot of overlap between the idea of placebo and the idea of hypnosis. Separate the two index fingers. Lift your hands and your arms up. First of all, they're all based on belief, expectation, and suggestion. A hypnotic induction is a procedure that has no active ingredient except for the person's belief and understanding about what it is supposed to do. Mike Bauer is a dentist and a hypnotist. He's preparing David for a major procedure. He's going to extract his wisdom tooth. So, as you can see from his x-ray, a lower wisdom tooth never developed in the first place, and that's why the upper tooth is actually erupting down into the space where that tooth would have been. When that happens, the tooth starts rubbing into the cheek, it starts fighting down in the gum below. Um, it also becomes very difficult for David to clean, and actually he's got some decay in this tooth, so almost impossible to get into the standard filling or restoration, um, and the tooth is in danger of breaking down and decaying further. Normally, removing a wisdom tooth would require the injection of a strong local anaesthetic. But David doesn't want one. I don't like the, uh, getting the injections and, and having the, the numb mouth afterwards. So I had the opportunity to uh, have hypnosis as a treatment for the, getting the wisdom teeth removed, and I thought I'd give it a go. 
Uh, Dave is having no pharmacological anaesthetic today. He's not taking anything, he's not having any injections. This is uh, going to be just hypnosis. This is the plan, of course. Um, if we need to use anaesthetic, then we have it. The only active ingredient in David's pain relief will be the way Mike interacts with him. His hypnotic induction. Just notice this wave of relaxation now. More and more in control of your thoughts and feelings. Calmer and calmer. Left, left, and all the, way up. the act of inducing hypnosis is a way of giving the person permission, disinhibiting them so that they can now believe in their own abilities to block pain, to experience things differently. There's all this now, the index finger and the thumb just feel kind of dull and sensitive on that. Yeah. Are you happy now to transfer that feeling around to cold, dull one and sensitive? David's wisdom tooth is firmly encased in the bone that surrounds it. Mike's first job is to gradually enlarge the socket. Throughout the procedure, David has been told to rate his pain on a zero to ten scale. Just write down any number there. I see you. Oh, that's excellent. Very, very good. Would you allow myself open again? Just pushing the pressure. Comfortable sensations. Again, just read that in any little number. A one. Clearly, David's pain scores aren't low because of any pain-killing drugs he's received. It's his own internal pain-killing systems that are working the same as those that can be activated by a placebo. You might think of hypnosis as a procedure that allows people to turn on their own ability to produce a placebo effect. Having widened the socket sufficiently, Mike is ready for the critical moment, tearing the tooth from the ligament that holds it in place. Um, Eyes open, wide awake. Mm. That was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Very well done. Good. So, in the final moment of removing the tooth, there's a lot of pressure, and I would be interested just to know what number you were at. It was a, probably a four-ish. About a four. The final moment, yeah. Without any form of pain relief, I would expect it to be, I would think, eight or a nine, um, without anything at all. So I think um, a number four is, uh, is excellent. It's such a different sensation. I didn't really feel anything. Like, just the point in which it, it pulled out, it was quite a, a sudden thing, but it wasn't, it wasn't anything more than that, I would have thought. By changing his expectations about what he would feel, Mike enabled David to release the painkillers in his brain. He gave him a placebo effect, not with a dummy pill or a sham surgery, but with words. Hypnosis may not be the only way to get a placebo effect non without deception, but it's certainly an excellent way to do that, and it's, you can think of it as an extra strength, non-deceptive placebo. It seems that something about the relationship between practitioner and patient lies at the heart of inducing a placebo effect without deception. So, is it possible for doctors to give patients a placebo effect by changing nothing more than their relationship with their patient? Answering that question could help provide the key to unlock our body's potential to heal itself. Could Capture set up an experiment to find out? People with irritable bowel syndrome were recruited to be treated with acupuncture. They were divided into different groups. In one group, the acupuncturist's interaction with their patient was strictly limited. We did not allow the practitioner to have an interaction with the patient. And that meant the um, patient came in, the practitioner said, my name is, I've read the charts, I'm going to treat you with acupuncture. I've been asked by the research scientists not to interact, to not confuse the scientific question. Hi, Mr. Casey. Come on in. 
in another group, the patients were treated in as caring and supportive a manner as possible. We added a warm, supportive relationship, which included delving deeply into a patient, patient's life, how did this affect your life, how, what, what's your relationship to these symptoms, how does it affect your being able to have family, friends, work, and, and tell me how, what kind of improvements you'd like to see, so I get a good sense of that. Empathy, expressing how we understood how difficult it was. It, this was some way we have to touch the patient. Uh, thoughtful silence, we tried to have the practitioner think for a moment and then ask to repeat a question, and some statement of confidence, I think this is going to work. I'm pretty sure these treatments are going to be very helpful for you, and I hope they push you along the next level. All Ted was interested in was the placebo effect of this interaction, so all active treatment was removed. The patients would receive acupuncture with needles that couldn't even puncture their skin. The needle is a, uh, it looks like an acupuncture pin. Uh, it's, it's impossible to tell the difference unless you have, I can barely see any difference. Now watch it go in. Watch it go in. And what happened is that it went up the shaft of the needle. It's like a magic sword. It's no surprise that a patient treated in a caring way might feel more looked after. You feel it yet? I do. Okay, but it's not bad, right? It's not bad. But could it really make them better? After all, it's just about being nice. But Ted's results show that the relationship between a doctor and their patient is significant. With no doctor-patient relationship, 42% uh, had adequate relief. And on the full Monty, the, uh, everything with doctor-patient and uh, the practitioner relationship and all the other arms, we got 62% reporting adequate relief. What it's telling us is that a practitioner interaction dramatically optimizes the placebo effect. Ted's study shows that a doctor can potentially create a placebo effect just by changing the way they behave and the things they say. It's still early days with research at Harvard, but it suggests that we can use the power of the placebo effect to help make drugs and surgery more effective. Placebo research is still in its infancy. There's much more to learn. Why do some people respond better than others? Do genetics play a role? What exactly does a doctor need to do to harness a placebo effect? But one thing we know for sure is that it's real. Even the most skeptical people now accept that there is something in the placebo effect. And that's the sea change on 20 or 30 years ago where people were routinely describing the placebo as an experimental artifact. The placebo effect is real, quantifiable, and in fact you're doing quite well with an active therapy if you can get as good a response as the placebo response. The pills and procedures of modern medicine have brought us unprecedented good health. But in many cases, it seems they're not acting alone. The placebo effect is intertwined with everything we do in healthcare. It was there from the beginning, it'll be there to the end. The challenge facing researchers now is to better understand the mechanisms by which it works so that ultimately we can use it and make the most of the power of the placebo.